and welcome back to our weekly episodes about our weekly teaching. Um, today we're talking all about dementia. So let's get started with a case study. Brilliant. So today's case study is a 78-year-old lady called Polly. Let's find out a little bit about her. So Polly used to work as a secretary and she always took great pride in her ability to remember details. She enjoys doing crosswords in the evenings and watching quiz shows on TV. Over the past year, however, she has been mixing up and sometimes even forgetting the names of her grandchildren, who she looks after twice a week and is very, very close to. She's only been able to get one or two of the crossword clues in the paper before becoming frustrated recently, when she previously have completed them without any great difficulty. She has been taking longer to prepare her lunch each day and has been using old recipe books that she hasn't needed to bring out for decades. Her daughter comments that on the phone there have been several times recently where Polly has lost her trail of thought while talking about something she had been doing. And also she's had times where she's completely forgotten what she's been saying mid-sentence. This has left Polly feeling upset, frustrated and anxious about whether something might be wrong. So the first point that we want to look at in relation to dementia before we get onto Polly's story later in the video is that there are four main types of dementia, and you'll probably have heard of most of these, if not all of them. That is Alzheimer's dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. So first of all, let's focus on the most common one. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia, and it affects 520,000 people in the UK today. Alzheimer's is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that makes up about 60 to 70% of all the known cases of dementia. It was first recognized by a German man called Alois Alzheimer, who was a psychiatrist and the first person to identify what he called pre-senile dementia in the early 1900s. He had been looking after a lady called Augusta, and she was a lady in her 50s who displayed short-term memory loss, delusions, and some behavioral symptoms. Dr. Alzheimer became really fascinated in this case and followed her up over a few years. This lady died aged only 55 and a post-mortem showed neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques in her brain. We won't go into too much detail on those, but we'll touch on it because these have gone on to become the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease as we know it today. So as I said, without going into too much complex pathology, Alzheimer's tends to be caused by an accumulation of these proteins in the brain, known as tau proteins, which form neurofibrillary tangles. And these tend to present along with large areas of brain atrophy. And this atrophy, where neurons are lost and the brain shrinks quite rapidly, is something that can be seen on CT imaging of the head. There is no known cure for Alzheimer's disease, or any form of dementia for that matter, And so it is a condition that needs managed with a multifaceted care plan. This involves medications and also non-pharmacological interventions. But we'll get onto all of that in a few moments time once Georgie tells us about another type of dementia. So vascular dementia is the second most common type of dementia affecting 150,000 people in the UK. It's a disease that tends to progress in a stepwise manner. And some people have a mixed dementia between Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. This is the most common mix. Treatment for vascular dementia aims to tackle the underlying cause, which may reduce the speed at which the brain cells are lost. So this is kind of generally the advice that we give anyone for any vascular pathology. So thinking about eating a healthy, balanced diet, losing weight if they're overweight, stopping smoking, cutting down on alcohol, doing regular exercise and taking medications for blood pressure and high cholesterol. Vascular dementia is caused when there's a reduced blood flow to the brain, which damages and eventually kills brain cells. One of the reasons that we want to be good at treating strokes and TIAs, which we talked about last week, is because multiple strokes and TIAs can cause damage that can lead to vascular dementia. And in fact, we talked about how strokes can lead to a doubling your risk of dementias. So a lot of the things that we say in our public health messaging and tell people in their younger years is really important to tell them that this is to decrease their risk of vascular dementia when they're older. Next up, and this is something that can be quite a complex topic. We're going to chat about medications, but don't worry, we're not gonna get bogged down in lots of specific drug names. We're going to try and keep it broad in general. So the medications, 
and I'll mention a few of their names. They can help in most types of dementia, but not frontotemporal. I'll get back to that soon. But first line treatment should always be lifestyle and environmental modification. So we're going to talk about some of the non-pharmacological interventions we can make in a few minutes time. Georgie's going to do that. But first, I'm just going to touch on some of the medicines that we do give people with dementia. So on this slide, we can see the different drugs that we might offer people with different types of dementia and different severities of those types. We can see here NICE's current recommendations. The first line treatment in mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like donepazil and rivastigmine. So as you might remember from our video on multimorbidity, where we touched on the anticholinergic burden of meds, acetylcholine is the name of a neurotransmitter that helps facilitate communication between nerve cells in the brain. And it becomes depleted in Alzheimer's disease. So these medicines, these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, inhibit the action of the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So hopefully, by giving these medicines, we can slow down the progression of the disease. Memantine, for more severe dementia, works in a slightly different way and blocks a different chemical called glutamate, which is produced excessively in brain cells that are damaged by Alzheimer's disease. Memantine is associated with a significant improvement in cognitive function in patients who take it and also helps with behavioral symptoms in moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. So agitation can be extremely stressful for caregivers. We understand that. We've seen that for ourselves. And it is so important that we investigate other things and try other interventions before we reach for the medications for these patients because that tends to be the most successful strategy and I'll go into a little bit more about why that is by showing you a few papers that have been done and research that has been done that has shown that different medicines have not had the impact that we thought they might have on helping agitation in people with dementia. So the mainstay of treatment for agitation and dementia is antipsychotics but Research has shown that these have low efficacy or, I quote, minimal or no efficacy with strong placebo effects. They can cause harm. So in 2009 in the UK, there were 1,800 deaths and 1,620 cerebrovascular adverse events attributed to the use of antipsychotics in dementia. The only ones currently licensed in the UK for agitation and dementia are risperidone and haloperidol. And lots of studies have been carried out, but no breakthrough findings have come up in terms of an effective medication-based treatment for agitation and dementia. So I'll just very quickly walk you through a few of those studies. So other than antipsychotic medications, other drug treatments which have been considered in terms of treating agitation in people with dementia include denepazil and memantine. But again, studies have shown that both do not significantly improve agitation in dementia patients. So I mentioned a moment ago that they can be given to people with dementia, but in terms of specifically targeting agitation, studies have shown that they are not necessarily effective at doing that. Antidepressants, for example, citalopram, have been increasingly used to treat agitation in dementia, but they are not mentioned as a potential treatment for agitation in the current NICE guidelines on the management of dementia. Because of all these bits of research that have been done over the years and not found a satisfactory result, a large study was organised in recent years, which was published just at the end of last year, 2021, to assess the effectiveness of mirtazapine as it has less anticholinergic effects than a lot of antidepressant meds. And as you can see from the slide just here, uh, mirtazapine was found not to be effective in treating agitation in people with dementia. Over 200 patients were split into mirtazapine and placebo groups. All of them were patients with dementia. They were given the meds for 12 weeks in total. And agitation was measured at zero weeks, halfway through at six weeks, and at the end of the block at 12 weeks. And there was found to be no benefit of giving mirtazapine compared with the placebo. And actually, there was potentially a higher mortality associated with the use of mirtazapine. So all of this suggests to us that non-pharmacological means might be the best starting point with these kind of patients. And that brings us on to our next point.